Hello everyone, and welcome to the 129th episode of Analyzing Evil, featuring the characters and themes of Menace to Society, one of the most powerful drama films that pictures the struggle of black Americans living in South Central LA. This film delivers us images of strife and misery, but also of hope and change. For a long time now, people have been requesting that I cover O-Dog, but I figured it would be best to examine this film and its message as a whole as the evil we can find within it is not exclusive to O-Dog. So, in this video, we'll be taking a look at how the circumstances we find the characters in this film living in developed, and how their actions contribute to the continuation of those circumstances. Now without further ado, let's begin. There are several issues that developed over time and in succession that contributed to the creation of the events we see in this film and it all started with the overall environment that black people were forced to live in when they first immigrated to this city. In the beginning of the film, we're shown some brief footage of the Watts riots in 1965, and this event, as well as the history of black people in Los Angeles, is central in understanding the events that occur in this film. And to understand why the Watts riots occurred in the first place, we need to take a look at how the black population in Los Angeles developed. In the 1940s, something called the Second Great Migration happened, which was the migration of black people from the South to other areas of the country in response to the influx of jobs created by World War II. Now, the primary reason this migration occurred was not necessarily because there were jobs available, but because President Roosevelt issued Executive Order 8802. This executive order was enacted to prohibit ethnic or racial discrimination in the nation's defense industry. This changed the game entirely, as not only were there jobs available, but jobs that were previously denied to minorities based on their ethnicity. And because there were many new defense jobs created at the start of the war on the West Coast, many black people chose to settle in major cities like Phoenix, Seattle, and of course, Los Angeles. Thus, the black population in Los Angeles increased from around 63,700 to 350,000 by 1965. Now, although there were ample opportunities during wartime for minorities, those opportunities inevitably came to an end once the war concluded. And now, without access to guaranteed jobs, the minority communities of Los Angeles found themselves in a disadvantageous situation. You see, like most places in America during this time period, Los Angeles was divided along ethnic lines, but that wasn't necessarily the issue. The issue was that there were restrictive covenants in place that barred certain minorities from renting or buying property in certain areas. And by the 40s, a staggering 95% of Los Angeles and Southern California housing was off limits to certain minorities. So naturally, they settled where they could. And because the best neighborhoods were often designated as white only, they were forced to inhabit the less desirable areas of the city. Couple that with a lack of jobs, and you have a recipe for an inherently impoverished community with little chance of upward mobility. The tension this created slowly simmered amongst the black community, and many other injustices that occurred between the 40s and 1965 only contributed to this. And it was only a matter of time until some unfortunate occurrence would cause this powder keg of emotions to explode. That occurrence ended up being the arrest and beating of Marquette Fry after he was pulled over for reckless driving. Hundreds of onlookers watched as Marquette, his brother Ronald, and their mother Rena were arrested. And after a rumor spread that Marquette had been roughed up and that the police had kicked a pregnant woman, the Watts riots commenced. This uprising lasted for six days before it was quelled by police. And in the ensuing chaos, 34 people lost their lives, over a thousand were injured, and near 3,500 arrested. This situation and these riots were not unique to Los Angeles, however, and similar riots occurred throughout the country during the latter half of the 1960s. Regardless, the outcome of the Watts riots was strife, misery, and destruction, and any positivity that came of them was slim at best. White people fled Watts and the surrounding neighborhoods like Compton, Southgate, and Huntington Park in droves. And though this provided more housing opportunities for black people in these areas, the standards and living conditions found there were all too similar to the ones they had been enduring in Watts. Governor Pat Brown implemented a commission to investigate the riots, which is known as the McCone Commission, and its findings and the results of it were as follows. 
The McCone Commission identified the root causes of the riots to be high unemployment, poor schools, and related inferior living conditions that were endured by African Americans and Watts. Recommendations for addressing these problems included emergency literacy and preschool programs, improved police community ties, increased low-income housing, more job training projects, upgraded healthcare services, more efficient public transportation, and many more. Most of these recommendations were never implemented. With all this in mind, the only identifiable results of the Watts riots were a heavy dose of more of the same, an increase in racial tension between the black and white populations of LA, and a people exposed to violence and injustice. And though everyone involved is affected by these events, it's the impressionable youth who are harmed the most, as now you have children and young adults who are products of violence, poverty, and discontent, all of which translates into them developing into hardened adults with negative outlooks, living in a negative environment, who have little hope for the future. Once drugs had been introduced to the situation, things became astronomically worse. Out of work or struggling black men and women now resorted to selling drugs and committing other violent crimes to support themselves, activities that provided far more income than whatever meager employment they were given. Thus a new culture formed around these activities, and the people who engaged in them were a far cry from the hopeful, hard-working people who had come to this city looking to make a better life for themselves and their families. And now, we've arrived at the next issue that created the world of Kane and Odog, culture. After we're shown the Watts riots, we're given a glimpse into Kane's childhood. Here we find a young man surrounded by two present, yet absent parents, one a drug addict, one a drug dealer. And we also find other gangsters, thieves, and drug dealers in his immediate vicinity. Naturally, Kane bears witness to all their deplorable behavior, drug use, gambling, alcoholism, domestic violence, murder, you name it, and Kane has probably seen it, oftentimes in his own household. It was not enough for Kane just to see it, however. He experienced it as well. He learned how to handle a gun from family friends. His father taught him how to make drugs. Purnell, the man who looked after him, later went to prison for life for murder. And what Kane learned from him, we can only guess, but it couldn't have been good. And this is the culture of Kane and the young men and women who grew up around him. One where crime stands at the center of family values. A world where these young people aspire to be like their parents. And with those aspirations, they follow in their footsteps, which only harms themselves and the people around them. The result is a world of crime and violence, of gangsters and drugs, of rundown project housing, and trash-filled streets. And in environments such as these, people can develop into brutal villains. And we're given one such extreme example in this film, in O-Dog. Sadistic, unempathetic, and entirely without a conscience, we find O-Dog committing unwarranted and horrific acts of violence in this film. And as Kane so expertly puts it, he really is America's nightmare. The boogeyman that people imagine lurking around the corner of every ghetto street, waiting to gun you down for no reason. O-Dog is the extreme though, and he is an exception, not a rule. But it's still a terrifying reality that negative environments like the one he grew up in can shape people into beasts like this. Now, though a number of the racial injustices that plagued people in the past have been done away with by the time Kane and friends have grown up, there are many that still affect them during the time that this story takes place. A notable example is the beating that Kane and Sharif experience at the hand of two police officers who stop and arrest them. Here we see these officers brutalizing them before they throw them into an unfriendly neighborhood to suffer even more abuse. Thankfully, the Latinos here choose to help them rather than hurt them, but why this type of violence occurs can be traced back to the issues that we've already discussed. As I already mentioned, LA has more or less always been drawn along racial lines, and with that, the legacy of the violent uprising that occurred during the Watts riots, and the criminal culture that subsequently developed over the course of several decades, white people, and more specifically here, white police officers, always have these negative aspects of their history, the history of their city, and the current state of affairs in their city, on their mind. And just as the culture of crime that Kane was exposed to shaped him into the man he is, these officers have been exposed to a culture where black people are viewed as the violent others, the people who set entire neighborhoods aflame when they were younger, the people who their parents warned them to steer clear of, and now, the criminals who they see dirtying their city and threatening their way of life. 
As we see at the beginning of the film, this type of behavior isn't exclusive to just white people, as the Korean owners of the convenience store we find Kane and Odog in at the beginning of the story are wary of them because they've been conditioned by repeated experiences with criminals coming into their stores and stealing their merchandise. Obviously, sometimes this tension is justified, as Odog does murder them, though to be fair, he probably wouldn't have if the store owner hadn't made a comment about him as he was leaving, though that certainly isn't an excuse to murder someone. And you can't always blame a police officer for being suspect of people who look like they might be committing crimes, because sometimes they are. But it's not healthy for any group of people to judge others based on the blanket assumptions they've made of whichever group of people they belong to, and treating every black person who walks into your store like a thug, or arresting them for the same reason, only hurts everyone in the long run. So just as all that black people experienced throughout the many decades running up to the events of this story shaped how they are, so too has it affected the people of other races, who were conditioned by their own environments, to behave the way they do. And the final issue that condemns the people we see in this film to live in such a horrific environment is a combination of apathy, acceptance, and a refusal to change. It's the attitude of, what are you gonna do, that has the people in this story viewing their circumstances as a way of life that they can't change. And it's the acceptance of what they believe to be a fact of life that causes them to languish in their current lifestyles, rather than attempt to change themselves for the better. Similarly, you have people like Odog, who wouldn't change, even if they weren't apathetic, as they've glorified and glamorized the life that they live. And to change that would be selling out and settling for what they view as less. They've been so ingrained in a culture that was created by hardship and strife that changing is now seen as an impossibility. And that's true for the other groups that I've already mentioned as well. It's the refusal of the gangster to put down the gun and make something more of himself that leads to young men dying on street corners and in alleyways. It's the refusal of the police officer to view the people that commit these crimes, or people who simply look like them, as more than just criminals, which leads to unjust arrests and beatings. It's the refusal of the drug dealer to stop selling poison to those in his community so he can line his own pockets that condemns the people around him to wallow in misery and addiction. It's the refusal of others to see the humanity in people who are different from them. As Ronnie explains to Anthony, not all cops are bad, and conversely, not all gangsters are inherently bad people who are incapable of change. In fact, it's the people who do change who make a difference. It's Ronnie, Kane, Stacy, and Sharif moving to other environments to try and escape the dreadful one they live in. It's Sharif converting to Islam and changing his ways and trying to convince others to change theirs. And it's everyone else seeing the good in people and treating them as human beings, not monsters who deserve to be beaten and thrown in a cell or treaded around lightly lest they bare their teeth and devour you. The evil in this story is very real, and it's something that many people have had to deal with, or are currently dealing with now. And though we can't change what created this evil, we can always change ourselves and try to make that same change in those around us. Unfortunately, though Cain tries to leave behind a life that can only bring him harm and untimely death, he ends up suffering the consequences of his actions. And this goes to show that even though you might try to make a change in your life, sometimes you might be too late, but you can always try. And as long as you're still breathing, it's never too late. You can change your ways. You can be the beacon of positivity and hope that your family or your community needs. You can right the wrongs of the past and move towards a better tomorrow. And if anything, menace to society teaches us one thing. Though evil can be overwhelming and unfair, it's never certain. It's not immortal, and it can be ended. Thank you all for tuning into this episode of Analyzing Evil, and I hope you've enjoyed. What are your thoughts on menace to society? Did I miss anything? Let me know down below, and leave a suggestion for a villain you'd like to see featured while you're at it. If you like this video, hit that thumbs up button, and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. A big thank you to all of my subscribers, to my patrons, and to anyone who's decided to honor me with a super thank, and a most vile thank you to those whose names you're seeing on screen now. Join the channel's Discord server and Reddit to interact with myself and the community, and follow me on the social media platforms listed below to keep up with the channel. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon.